I was thinking about how to start off this morning on Palm Sunday, made me think about how all of us in this room here, we face questions every day, don't we? And we have those what I call the mundane questions, the everyday questions. And for me, here's some of the questions I ask myself is, what should I eat? You know, what should I wear today? Or what tasks do I have to complete today? But beyond those mundane questions, we also have those life-defining questions, questions that maybe some of you may, are thinking about right now. In my life, I've thought about where should I go to college? Or how about this one? What career should I pursue? Or another one would be whom should I marry? Should I marry anybody at all? But beyond those mundane, those life-defining questions are also what I call the foundational questions of life. Things like what gives my life value and purpose? You know, what impact is my life having from other, upon others? You know, what legacy am I leaving to those that know me? Or how about where am I going to go when I die? And I think we all can think about these questions. In some level, each of these questions have some type of impact upon our lives to a varying degree, right? But when I thought about these questions, they do not compare to the greatest question that you or I will ever face in this world. You know what that question is? It's this one. Who is Jesus? Because the way that you choose to answer that question will not only define how you're going to live your life right now, but it's going to define your eternal destiny. In fact, this question was so important. It was a question that Jesus asked his disciples. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is with his disciples at Caesarea Philippi. And it's a very interesting city that Jesus asked this question. Because we know about that city. It was a place of pagan worship. At the time of Jesus, people would go here to worship the Greek god Pan. He'd be in the picture of a half man, half goat. And there was also a temple that was built to worship the Roman emperor Caesar Augustus as an actual god. So in this city, where all this pagan worship is going on, Jesus asked this very important question. And this is what he says in verse 13. He says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? In other words, the question is, who am I? Who is Jesus? And I want you to understand, Jesus didn't ask this question because he was going through some personal identity crisis. He wasn't like, oh my gosh, who am I? That's not why he asked it. Nor did Jesus ask it because he was preoccupied with what other people thought about him. I mean, if Jesus was living today, he wouldn't be on his social media page every day saying, who liked my page today? That's not who Jesus was. Because as we're going to see as we go through this passage, there is a follow-up question that Jesus wants to ask. And listen to me, it's not just for his disciples, but it's for you and I. And so we find in verse 14 how his Disciples give a few answers to what people think about who he is. And they say, some of you, or some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So what we find when Jesus was here on earth, there is a diversity of opinion about who he was. You know, it's no different than today, right? If I were to walk out of here, if you were to walk out and start asking people who's Jesus, you're going to get a multitude of answers. Some of the ones that I have found is the following. They say Jesus is a prophet. He's a miracle worker spiritually enlightened person. He's an advocate for the poor and the needy. He's a social reformer. Or he's just a virtual or moral individual that we should try to live our lives like. And see, I want you to understand that why all these opinions both back then and today, they carry with it a certain level of respect and honor about Jesus, don't they? But at the heart, please listen to me, they all fall short in giving us a clear understanding of Jesus' true identity. And so in verse 15, Jesus now does that follow-up question, that more important question. He says this, but who do you say that I am? As I said before, it's not just a question that in the context, yes, Jesus has asked his disciples. He's asking you and I today, who am I? Because the, 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 the foundation of how you answer that does not depend upon the opinion of people around you. It doesn't depend upon the opinion of this world or even some of the greatest scholars. The question really comes down to how do you going to answer that important question? And so in verse 16, Peter gives his answer. He gives his confession of the identity of Jesus. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's a powerful confession. Because he's looking at Jesus as a Jewish person who believed in only one God. He says, first of all, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You're the one that we long for, the one that we waited for. But beyond the fact that you're the Messiah, you are God himself. In a city known for pagan worship, where they worship Greek gods and goddesses, where they worship the very emperor, he looks at Jesus Christ. He says, you are the one true God. What I want to do this morning is try to help all of us recapture this truth about Jesus. Because just like the crowds back then and just like today, everyone in this room has an opinion about Jesus. And what I found, which is also true of the church, not just the world around us, 
we often only see Jesus through the lenses of his human nature. We see him as the, great, as, the, as the good shepherd. We see him as a suffering servant, and certainly he is. But what we often lack is to see the fact that Jesus is also the Holy One of God. And like Peter, for you and I to truly understand who Jesus is, it's not a matter of me going outside the church and doing a poll for you. It's not a matter of saying, well, I read 15 scholars, here's what they tell you. Nor is it a matter of me as a pastor to tell you, this is what I think Jesus is. You know, I know how we find out who he is. We have got to go to the revealed word of God. In fact, is that not what Jesus said to Peter? Because in verse 17, he said, For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So let's just look at a few examples today from the Bible. We're going to see the fullness of Jesus' holy and divine character on display. And I want to begin in Luke chapter 18. And just to give you the context, Jesus has just gone with his disciples. They have sailed across the Sea of Galilee. They're now entering a country known as the Gerasenes. That would be a very important place because it was a predominantly Gentile area. That means there weren't Jews that were living there, or very few. And in fact, a good Jewish person wouldn't want to go travel there. You stay away from the places where the Gentiles are at. And what we find is that Jesus steps out on the boat, onto the land. He is met by a man who is possessed by demons, plural. In fact, you know in the context of the passage, the demon says, My name is Legion. We are many. And as you read the account, you know what you find? A detailed description about demon possession. We hear it all the time, right, about demon possession today. But I want to give you a biblical description of what that would look like in a person's life. We find out in the passage that a person who's possessed by a demon loses personal dignity. In fact, this man approaches Jesus without any clothes on. We see this also forces you to live in social isolation. This man who was possessed by these demons lived in a graveyard among the dead. He lived more like an animal than he lived like a human. We also see they had supernatural strength and uncontrollable behavior, which made him both a danger to himself and to other people. So the passage says that he was shackled. He was bound with chains, but he had the power whenever he wanted but through the demonic possession to be able to rip those chains and shackles apart. We see he had a loss of control of speech. That means the demons were able to communicate through him exactly what they wanted to say. And if you read the Gospel of Mark's account, it said that, that he endured self-mutilation. In fact, Mark says that he would cry out and cut himself. I want you to get that picture because this man right here, he is not only daily tormented by these demons, he is under their complete control. And so in verse 28, we are told this demon-possessed man who could not be bound by chains and shackles, who brought fear to the people that lived in that area, that when he saw Jesus, listen, he cried out and fell down before him. And he said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. This is a powerful statement by these demons, isn't it? Because I want you to see that they are aware of two things about Jesus. First of all, they are aware of his divine identity. They know he is God. They're not looking at Jesus and saying, Oh, here comes another prophet. Here comes another miracle worker. They are 100% confident and certain that they know that this man is God himself. But beyond the fact they know his identity, guess what else they know? His divine authority. They know that he has authority over them to do what he wants with them. It's a powerful picture to see demons acknowledging the true identity of Jesus. But I want to give you this warning. Because I want you to understand that what is more important than what you know about Jesus, it's also accepting what he has done for you. You see, there's people in the church, and there's maybe some here today. You have come today with an intellectual knowledge of Jesus. And by the way, it may be a correct knowledge of Jesus. You can give me, you know, the whole understanding of Jesus' nature. He's fully God and fully man, and that's great to hear. But I want to under, let you understand that just like these demons, knowledge in itself is not enough to save. You have to commit and believe what he has done for you, that he went to the cross to set you free from your sin. So don't leave today thinking, because I've got some intellectual knowledge and I'm good. It is more than what you know, it's what you believe in that will bring transformation in your life. And I encourage you, on your own, read the rest of the story. Because as you begin to see Jesus interact with this demonic man, you see, first of all, they are subject to him. But secondly, he has the power to set anyone free from their control. You know, I've spent a lot of uh, my life in the past researching the occult. And the one thing you find about the occult is that When people are dealing with demon possession, or we call it demon oppression, 
and they talk about their stories of being set free, it always comes back to one thing. You know what it is? That I could not find freedom until I called on the name of Jesus Christ. They say there was power in that name, that no matter what I was going through, that power of that name set me free. It's the power of Jesus that we believe in. My daughter the other day came into my wife in my bedroom at night. She said, Mom and Dad, I'm scared. I had a bad dream. And I looked at her. I said, "Hun, you don't need to be afraid. Mom and I are right down the hall from you. But I said, more importantly than that, Jesus is with, always with you. There is no need to fear. You see, the Jesus that we see in Scripture is a Jesus that has authority over the supernatural realm. Second example I want to show you of the fullness of Jesus' holy and divine character is on Palm Sunday, the very day that we're here celebrating. And Palm Sunday is a powerful day because not only is Jesus going into the Jerusalem, what we call the triumphal entry, but it sets the stage for what we call Passion Week. Those final events of his last week of his life before he would die on the cross and rise from the grave. I want to read some of these details from Matthew chapter 21 because Matthew says to us that Jesus approaches the city of Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Now you think about it. If you're a general, you just conquered an army. If you're an emperor, you're going to come on a white horse, right? It's a sign of authority, a sign of victory. Why would Jesus come riding on a donkey? Is that all he had? Oh, there's much significance about this. Because the fact of him riding on the donkey, you know what he's telling the crowd when he comes in Jerusalem? He says, I am your Messiah. I am your king. In fact, what Jesus is doing here, he's telling them, I am the one who was foretold by the prophets that I have come to bring peace and salvation to this world. In fact, the very fact of Jesus riding that donkey was a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy back in the book of Zechariah. This is what it says in chapter 9, verse 9. It says, Rejoice greatly. O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. You know what? When Jesus came on that donkey, the crowd knew exactly what Jesus was doing. They knew what he was claiming, so what did they do? They began to take their coats, their cloaks off and lay it down on the road, right? They began to get palm branches and cut them and lay it down the road. That was an act of them saying, Jesus, we acknowledge what you're doing. You are our Messiah. You are our King. And in fact, their actions are only backed up by their words because in verse 9, what does the crowd begin to shout? They say, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. I want you to picture the crowd as saying, you are a king, you are a Messiah. You have come to save us. That's what Hosanna means. Hosanna is a plea for salvation and for deliverance. Man, what a powerful picture of who Jesus is. He is the one who's come to bring peace. He is the one who's come to bring salvation. And please understand, we have seen many great men try to do this, right? We've seen great leaders try to bring peace to the world, and every attempt that they do, they fail in. But I'll tell you, there's one who will bring lasting peace, and his name is Jesus Christ. But before we look at our final example, where we're going to look at the fullness of Jesus' holy and divine character, I want you to understand what is happening here on Palm Sunday. You see, the crowd that day has certain expectations of who Jesus was or who they wanted him to be and what they wanted Jesus to do. See, they were all excited. They think, okay, Jesus is now here. He's our Messiah and King, but they saw him in a political lenses, right? He is now here to conquer the Romans, to destroy those pagan oppressors, right? And he's going to come, and at this very moment, he will establish his kingdom here on earth right now. I think for many of us, we relate to that, don't we? We have these certain expectations about who Jesus is and what we want Jesus to do. But listen, that crowd, because their expectations were not met, within one week, they went from saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, to saying, crucify him. And sometimes it boggles our minds. We think about this story, it's so familiar to us. We're like, what would, how could in one week they go from saying that to saying now we want him to die? But you know what? Are we no different than the crowds that day? If you think about it, many of us approach Jesus with our own expectations. We define for ourselves who he, what we want him to be and what we want him to do. I meet people all the time. They say, you know what? I'll follow Jesus if he does this for me. And I'll follow Jesus if I get that. It's an if approach to following Jesus. And what ends up happening? Like those crowds on Palm Sunday... At one moment, I watched people walking into a church, and they were saying, Hosanna, praise the Lord. But then I walked them, watched them walk out, and through their actions and their attitudes, they were saying, crucify him. 
You know the power of this? Yes, you and I, man, we're going to change. We constantly change for good and the bad. But no matter what we do, no matter where we fall short, guess who does not change? Jesus Christ. That compassion, that love is still there no matter our own failures. He looks at you and I and says, I know one day you'll praise me, the next day you'll call for me my death. But guess what? I love you so much that I will go to that cross to set you free. That's the Jesus that we worship. He's not just one who has authority over the demonic realm, but he is one, despite your own failures, he looks at you and says, I will still give my life to set you free from your sin. The final example I want to look at today takes us to the moment that Jesus died on the cross. We're in Matthew chapter 27. And the chapter opens up, but Jesus is taken before the Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. He is then condemned to death. Then he's taken to Golgotha to be crucified. And while he's on that cross, Jesus receives constant mocking and taunting by those around him. You see, we often get this picture that Jesus was uh, crucified in some hill or mountain far away, but that's not how they did it. What the Romans would do, they would do it outside the gate of the city, where the cross was where people were walking as a sign that if you go against the Roman government, this is going to be your fate. And so there's Jesus on the cross. And the very first people that begin to mock him is the crowds. In fact, we're told about this in verse 40. It says, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days... Save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. And not only is the crowd, but now all of a sudden the religious authorities, they start jumping in. They begin to start mocking Jesus. This is what they say. He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross. And we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. But you know, as this scene is unfolding, guess who we often forget in this story? The Roman centurion, the other soldiers. The very ones who executed Jesus. Because as all these events are going on, they're there standing at the cross. And I'm sure they woke up that day and said, oh, it's going to be another one of those days. How many executions do we have today? And so they're just going through what their daily ritual is. They're just fulfilling their duty. And I'm sure when that day began, if you would have said to them, who is this Jesus person? They would have looked at you and said, does it matter? He's just another criminal like all the other ones that we have crucified in the past. But as the events surrounding Jesus' death begin to unfold, we're told that there is a radical change in the lives of these executioners. In fact, the chapter tells us that when he died, there were supernatural signs that accompanied his death. And upon seeing these signs, guess what happened? These hardened soldiers who stood there and had... And, and, approved of the execution of so many people. They looked at Jesus, and now they said, saw something unique about him. They realized this is not like anyone else that we have ever executed. And what's powerful is this. What Jesus was being mocked for by the crowds and was even being mocked for by the religious authorities, the very ones who executed it began to affirm the truth of it. Because what does the centurion say? He says, truly, this was the Son of God. It's a powerful statement because the very reason why Jesus Christ was condemned to death is now being affirmed by the one who executed him. It's the power of Jesus. Now there's debate among biblical scholars whether there is is a true affirmation of saving faith. And outside of what the centurion says, we're not told anything else in Scripture. So we can't come to a definitive conclusion about that, but I'll just simply say this. A true saving faith in Jesus will not just be accompanied by a verbal confession about who he is, but it will also come with a lifestyle that reflects the truth of that confession. In other words, I'm not looking at you and you shouldn't look at me and say, hey, what do you believe? And you just tell me by your words. I should look, look at you and you should look at me and say, I know what you believe by your actions. Your lifestyle reflects the fact that you know who Jesus is and you're living your life in light of that truth. That's what we see here. Because who do we find that Jesus is today? We see that he is the very one that has authority over the spiritual realm. He is the one who alone can bring salvation and peace to this world. And he is the one and alone that he is the one true son of God. And the one thing that we'll talk about next week on Resurrection Sunday is that when someone comes and encounters not the Jesus of the world, not the Jesus of our own opinion, but the Jesus of the Bible they will never walk away the same. They will walk away forever changed. I want to close with a scene 
that occurs in heaven. It's described in detail in Revelation chapter 5. In the scene, there's a scroll. And the scroll is very important because within the scroll is the future course of human history. It's that moment that when the scroll is broken, everything that we see in the world, all the evil, all the injustice, all the pain, the suffering, will one day be eradicated. And what happens in the scene is that there is no one found in heaven or on earth who is worthy to open the scroll. The apostle John, who has seen this unfold, he begins to weep in hopelessness. Because if no one could open the scroll, then what does that mean about us? What does it mean about human history? But in the moment of that hopelessness, the moment of him weeping, guess what happens? There is one who comes forth who is worthy to open that scroll. There is one who comes forth who is worthy to correct all the wrongs in this world. And guess who that worthy one was? It is the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And in that moment of hopelessness and weeping, quickly turns to rejoicing. Where all heaven begins to say the following, verse 12. They say, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might to honor and glory and blessing. What an affirmation about who Jesus Christ is. But here's the thing. It is not was once again that question, who is Jesus, is more than what you know. It is how you live your life in light of that. And my challenge to all of you, live your life in such a way that people see in you the truth of who Jesus Christ really is. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we stand here overwhelmed and amazed and appreciative for who you are and what you have done. You are the one who has authority over the spiritual realm. You are the one who provides salvation and peace to this world. You are the Holy One of God. And I pray, God, that for all of us here who know you, that we will live our lives in light of the truth of that fact so that others can see in us the the need that they have for their own lives. And this we ask in your son's precious name, Jesus. Amen.